This morning we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 6, uh, verses 9 through 12. Last week we had a, not a very encouraging week. Uh, It may feel that way, I guess. Uh, To me, it is a very encouraging thing to know that God cares about who we are, what we do, and where we're going. Um, I'm, I'm very happy that instead of an idea of a, uh, a simple system of religion where you do something and then expect for God to reply in a certain way, that He expects to have a relationship with us and that we can have that relationship ongoing with Him. Uh, that is a, that's an encouraging thing to me. Um, this week, we're going to move more into that uh, encouragement as we, as the author of Hebrews moves away from this uh, rebuke into an encouragement of going forward and who we are as followers of Christ. Um, but one thing you'll, you'll learn, uh, I think Paul does this pretty well, but the author of Hebrews does it pretty good too, but sometimes uh, you ever feel like someone, maybe your, your grandmother, if you've ever experienced this, they'll give you a big hug and then pat your belly and be like, oh, okay, well, wait, huh? It's like, I love you, but I just want to make sure you, you know, don't get too big for your britches. Uh, I, I've experienced that many times in my life. Uh, or maybe someone tells you something really nice, but then kind of says something in a way that maybe just kind of encourages you to make sure that you're paying attention to what you're doing right. Is that, maybe that's it, just a... They call that marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, that, that's, uh, I don't want to go to your house today. That's because uh, Sherry has to go to work today, so Rick's like, I'm, I'm all right. <laughs> um, but yes, that, that is, that's very good. I, I agree, um, sort of, only a little bit. Um, <laughs> but uh, Hebrews, the author of Hebrews is doing sort of the same thing. He's, he's telling you, now we don't, don't think that about you, but just in case, right? It's kind of that, hey, yeah, we love you, but keep going. And that's what I believe that we all need uh, most of the time. We don't need to just be encouraged, right? Have you ever been around somebody who their kid, like all they ever got was encouragement? <laughs> I heard some hellos out there like, whoa. Like, you want your kid to feel encouraged, right? You want them to know that they can do things. I was taught my entire life that there was nothing that I could not do. And I still believe that, that if there's something that's going on, I think I can just do it. That's just how I was raised or programmed or you know, whatever you think of it. But I remember growing up working in the junkyard, and it was there was never a, can you go fix this? It was just go do it, right? And so I've carried that with me throughout my life. You just go do things, right? Encouragement is a good thing. But sometimes, what else do you need? You need discipline as well. We need to be reminded that there are boundaries in which we live, right? Uh, when a child has been raised on only encouragement, how do they act? However they want, right? We need to know what is expected of us. We need to know how to discipline not only ourselves, but how to accept the discipline of the Lord as well. We need to know what we're supposed to be doing. So in Hebrews uh, chapter 6, verses 9 through 12, Really, in the last part of this, uh, in the very first part of Hebrews chapter 6, you get this uh, stern rebuke of the fact that uh, it's not something you did, it's something that you're doing. It's not something that we look back to, it's something that is an ongoing process of sanctification that proves the relationship that we have with God. Um, And then as we go on, let's go ahead and read it, but he's moving into this idea of, now I don't think this is about you, but... Just in case, make sure, right? So in chapter 6, verse 9, we start. I forgot my glasses, I'm sorry, so I have to hold it close. Uh, It says, though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name, serving the saints as you do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Let's pray. 
Lord Jesus, thank you once again for allowing us to gather together. Lord, I pray that uh, even in the midst of uh, just this thing that's going on, Lord, this uh, virus, and Lord, just uh, unrest in our nation, and Lord, just everything. Lord, I thank you that we have a time each week where we can gather together, where we can see one another, we can encourage one another, where we can pray for one another, where we can study your word together and sing your praises to you, Lord. We need this. We need a time to gather together. Lord, I just thank you that you've allowed us to be in a place where we can still have that. Lord, I pray that as we study your word today, as we go forward, Lord, that you would apply it to our hearts through your Holy Spirit. Lord, that as we uh, study what it is that you have for us, Lord, that you would change our hearts. Lord, if there's things that we come up against that, Lord, don't uh, seem right to us in your word, that you would remind us that you're right and we're wrong. Lord, help us to surrender completely to you. Lord, we thank you that we can have a relationship with you and know you. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Okay, so in verse 9, he says, Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. So right off the bat, if you just started in this verse, what would you need to do? You, you would be on, though we speak in what way, right? If I walked in the door and you caught the tail end of a joke that I was telling, what, what would you do? Like, what was the beginning of that, right? Like, there's the punchline, but what's the rest of it? I need to know. It's so important that when we study Scripture that we don't just jump in a verse and go. We need to know the context of what we're dealing with. We need to know what this is talking about. Sometimes we need to go back to the original language so that we can understand better what the words mean. Right? Because words, the way that we use them, change. It's important that we study God's Word, not just check some stuff out and move on. That's what we've talked about many times before, that God's Word is like links on the chain. They all touch one another. They hold each other together rather than pearls on a necklace. You, know, you take down a pearl and look at it and inspect it and kind of put it back and then move on to the next one. This all touches each other. It all goes together. Context is so important that we know what it is that we're reading. Um, that keeps us from error. So what he's talking about is, as we go back to last week, where he just basically said, there's many of you that are within this group that don't know Christ. There are going to be those who come in, who taste, who see the power of God within the church, who are around it, they don't swallow it. They don't grasp it. They don't hang on to it. They fall away. Not those that lose their salvation, because that doesn't happen, but those who never had their salvation, who maybe showcase some evidences, but it was weak. <coughs> and it was forfeited. It was the seed that fell on rocky soil. It was the seed that fell uh, over in the thorns, right? So he's saying, though we speak up to you in these ways, though we talk to you guys about this stuff, this is not what we believe for you. This isn't what we think. This isn't the thing that I'm standing here before you and pointing my finger at all of you guys at that. Right? That's what the author of Hebrews is wanting to say. And it's not me standing before you and going, ha ha. That's not the point of this. He says, though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, I don't know about you, but there's not a whole lot of people that I... I don't use that word very much anyways, but like, beloved. Do you know, like, that means something. That, that's not a simple, hey guys, what's up, high five. When you call someone your beloved, it means that there's a deep intimacy with that person, right? That you have a connection that is not a surface level thing. Right? It, it's not just a simple thing, it's a deep thing. That's the point of what he's trying to say when he uses that word there. He's saying, like, this is not what I think about you, beloved. You guys are in this, but you need to understand that there's going to be those that come around that are not. I don't know. I didn't share many stories uh, last week about experiences that I've had, but uh, I'm sure I, like you, have had many experiences of people who have who've come in, 
to the church who have who've sprouted quickly, who have just been like, man, I just want to do this, and I want to do that, and I want to go, and I want to go, and I want to go. And then what happens? This was out. And that doesn't mean that zeal is a bad thing. That means that we've got to make sure that the foundation is sure before we start building on something, right? Because it is heartbreaking to lose someone like that. I remember in uh, high school, uh, when I was in high school, I, I, I got saved when I was in high school and I, I did had no idea what I was doing. I had a, a friend that was helping me uh, that really he had no idea what he was doing either. We were just idiots kind of together that were trying to go for Jesus. We're like, I don't know what to do, but we're excited, let's do this. And so we, we did some things, we did some pretty wrong things. I, I specifically did some very wrong things. Um, but I was trying, like I was going. And I remember we, we decided we were going to invite every person in our school uh, to our church. Because we didn't like go and tell them about Jesus. But like, no, we, we've got the pastor. We'll, we'll get them there and you do the rest. Uh, just in case you're wondering, that's a 17-year-old's idea of how to do this, not an adult. Like, you have the words of God to go and share and disciple people. Like, that's an awesome thing. So we decided we would do this and we had... Pretty much everybody in our class, for sure, uh, came to our church, visited for a while, those that didn't already go to another church. Um, and we had this one guy uh, that you know, I liked quite a bit. We spent quite a bit of time together. And uh, he came in, he made a profession, and he just was, let's go buy Bibles for everybody and just give them to them. And let's do this and let's do that. And it lasted about six months. And it fizzled. And it didn't really even fizzle, it just disappeared. I can tell you many, many stories of people just like that. And what he's wanting you to understand here, what the author is wanting you to understand is, I'm not talking to you like this. If you're here and you're part of this and you desire like you are the beloved, that you are the children of God. In fact, what you, what you go on to later in uh, verse 18 of chapter 6 is this idea of this anchor that we have that goes behind the veil into the holy place, into the very heart of God that goes from our heart into His heart. Like, it cannot be separated and it's forever. That is such an awesome thought to understand. So he's putting this thought together and he's saying that there are going to be those who you need to watch out for. There are going to be those that come in this that you need to be aware of. You see, though we speak to you in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things. Things that belong to salvation. The whole point of this passage, if you're looking for one overarching theme of, of everything here, from 9 to 12, is this idea of there's better things to come. There, there's more, right? It's that thing of like your, your grandma hugging you and patting your belly, right? I, I love you, you're in this, I, I, I care for you. There's more to do. There's more for you to do. You can have a greater impact. It's this thought of like, man, don't rest on your laurels. How many of you have ever accomplished something like really cool? I don't have to put your hands up, but maybe you won a competition, maybe you did something really good, your business succeeded, you made a lot of money, you, want to race, whatever. When I was in youth ministry, one of the first things I, I did every time we started a new church is that I would get all the kids together. Not like, all right, running time, but I would like, make this thing happen. And we would race. And I wanted to show them that I could beat every single one of them in a foot race. And as I got older, it got harder. And then eventually I was like, I don't care about that. It's dumb running. It's dumb. I don't know. You're faster than me. Um, but it's like, that, that's this thing of like, man, I can do it and I'm good and everything. But what happens when you get to that point of where you feel like you're the best, where you've accomplished, where you've made it? We start to look back on what we've done rather than on what we can accomplish. We start to look back at how great things used to be. We were talking uh, amongst family this, uh, this week and we we're kind of talking about these different things within the church. And one of the things that happens is when you start to only look back, that's a really good sign that your church is dying. That's a really good sign that everything, your best days are behind you. That's not who we are. That's not 
what we should think about. Knowing what happened before us is an awesome thing, and honoring that is a good thing. But there are better things to come. There's more to do. Uh, I wrote a, a, a simple little thing. I said, this type of encouragement is often necessary when things are going well. Right? What happens when things are going well? Kind of crude, right? Uh, you're go on a trip and you're in traffic. What do you do? You're paying attention to every little thing that's going on, right? You've got both hands on the wheel. You're, you're gripping it tight. You're looking at where all the different cars are. You're probably maybe getting a little mad, right? You ever feel like nobody else does this but me? I'm like, I'm gonna run this guy. Oh, not really. I'm sorry. Uh, would you guys forgive me? Uh, um, but you know, you, you're you're in the moment. You're doing what you, you're even looking for your path of how to get through these cars and get to the right place. And then what happens? Clears out. What do you do? Turn the radio up. Start talking. You quit paying too much attention, right? You put it on cruise control and you just kind of relax and one hand on the wheel. I, I'll admit to it, I hope no cops are watching, but I, I typically I like to use my knee so I can like put my arms out and stretch because it's just easy, right? This type of encouragement is necessary when we're in that position when we're cruising. Cruise control is engaged. You know, we're in the Tesla with autopilot going on. If I ever get to have that, like I, I don't know what I would do. That would be the most amazing thing. You just tell your car where you want to go and it takes you there. That's weird. But that's, that's the point of this. We need encouragement to know like there is still a fight that is out there. There are still people in this world who do not know the name of Jesus, period. Let alone there are people who actively like, are against him. You have the words of life. You have the ability to go and disciple. The fight's not over yet. Our best days are not behind us. There's still work to do. In verse 9, I'm sorry, verse 10, it says, For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. The church, specifically, we we'll talk because this is what we're part of, but the Southern Baptist Church is very effective in one very big thing. We're good at putting money together and sending it to places where it's necessary. Uh, I, I, my phone's right there. But I pulled up the, the image today and I was looking at the, uh, the budgets where we've been, how much we've spent, that sort of thing. Uh, in the month of June, uh, the countrywide nationally, uh, we collected 15 million, 179,000, something like that, some long thing. You know the, the two biggest Makes you feel good. Alabama and Florida are two of the, the biggest. <laughs> we're like, we got this. Y'all just kind of hang out. Um, but you know, it's we, we put together money. If you look at the uh, the year, I think I, I calculated it was about 175 million dollars that we put together every year, and 50% of that goes to global missions. 22% of that goes to uh, IMB, and that's along with Lottie Moon. Uh, Lottie Moon goes to which one? Here, right? North American Mission Board, Lottie Moon, that's all this. That's another huge amount of money. And then the other one is Annie Armstrong, and that goes everywhere else. Maybe I, I think I've got that right. Um, got it switched. Okay, Annie Armstrong's here, uh, Lottie Moon's going there. Uh, we are very good at doing that. And sometimes it's very easy to look and say, like, look what we're all doing. Look at this big thing that's going on. Look what we're part of. And we forget that we have a part to play here. Just because our money's going all over the place doesn't mean that we are. You have something to do in your community with those that are right around you. He's saying, for God is not unjust. He, he, he's not overlooking the thing that you're doing. What he's specifically probably talking about is this idea that this Congregation, these people were sending money to the Jerusalem Christians. Right? They were supporting them. They were in bad shape. Uh, the Jerusalem Christians, they were, they were poor, they were uh, not in a good place. 
And so these people were financially supporting them or taking care of them. That, that's part of what the church is here to do, right? To take care of those that are in need. Money, uh, service, doing what we need to do, right? He's saying God's not overlooking that. He knows what you've done. God knows where your money's going. If you're giving with a cheerful heart and you're putting your money out there, God is honored with that. And he's pleased with that. For God is not unjust to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. So he has this continuing things going on. Not just the, the money, the, the stuff that you're sending out in the service, but also the love. Do you know that when we pray for one another, and we're, just, like, we're demonstrating the love that we have for each other? When we pray for other churches or for people that are in other places, we're demonstrating a love that we have for them? That's the point of this. Like, you are doing something that is good. It's great. It's this awesome thing. God's aware of it. I, I, was, I just gave you the, the statistics of what the Southern Baptist Convention is doing. But we need to be very careful that we don't just look at that and think that we're done. It's, it's good. I wrote my check this week. I'm all right. There is more for us to do. We can get our hands dirty. There's so much, even in this small community in which we live, there are so many ways that we can go out. You know, let's just turn off the money idea for just a moment. I, I hate talking about money in general, but there's so much that we can do to serve one another. Even just within our congregation, there are people that need things, that need stuff done for them, right? And then you broaden that out to the community that's around us, there is service that we can do. I know that we are distracted right now. I, I understand that I'm distracted right now because the world seems is like there's a volcano fixing to happen. I, I don't know. It just seems like at any moment an asteroid could hit or something is bad. Uh, I saw somebody put something that's just like a blowtorch hitting somebody, and that's 2020. It's just terrible stuff left and right, and it's distracting. But we still are here. We still have a purpose. Not to look back at what we've done. Celebrate that. Honor that. Be happy with it. Look to what we can do. Look to the impact that we can have tomorrow and the next day. Ebenezer, your best days are not behind you. Your best days are ahead of you. Verse 11. It says, and we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. He's reiterating this, this understanding of what he taught earlier in this passage to say, like, we desire for you to showcase this earnestness. What does it mean to be earnest? Like, man, I'm really into this, right? Like, I'm dedicated to this. I always thought about, uh, I've always been a person who likes to do a lot of different things. Uh, I've had a lot of different interests, uh, and I like to know a little bit about a lot of different things. Uh, so you, you ask me about something, and I want to at least have some sort of a, a working knowledge of that thing. I uh, may not know very much about it, uh, but I, I can pretend a little bit to like have an interest with you, right? Uh, but when I was a, a teenager, surfing just became everything. That's all I thought about, all I cared about. That's where all my money went to, uh, is Natalie or, or surfing. And uh, so that's that was it. Like, that was earnestly devoted to this idea of surfing. I was not a good surfer. I was not, like, I don't know. It was, I could just do it. I had fun. But I was thinking about it. I was putting my money into it. I was putting my time to it. I was putting feet to it because I had to drive an hour just to go to the beach, right? had a lot of speeding tickets just to go surfing. Um, but that, that's the point. He's saying this earnestness, this, this thing like you still are just like in it. 
He's wanting to say, like, man, you're passionate about what you're doing. When we look at what we're doing as followers of Christ, as the church, are we passionate about it? Is this the thing that we not understand, please understand, not coming to church, but serving the Lord? Is that the thing that brings you happiness? It is the idea of like the song that we sang this morning of, of like, man, we're going to stand in the presence of God, see his face. I, it's going to sound goofy, and I'm okay with that. Y'all already think I'm goofy, so I don't care. But uh, I remember when we first had kids, and I'd pick them up and hold them, and they're a little, like even Adeline now, like she's, she's two, and she'll I'll pick her up, and she just like grabs on you, and she's like, man, it, it must be amazing to feel that safe and comfortable, or you're just like somebody is, especially if Natalie does it for Adeline. Me, she's like, yeah, it's, it's okay, I'll, I'll accept this. Natalie's just like, oh. Um, but I, I remember having this thought, like, man, one day, like, wouldn't it be awesome to have somebody that you could feel like that with? There, there was just this big person who could come, like, scoop you up and cradle you, like, it's okay. Like, on a bad day, wouldn't that be amazing? Like, oh, it's going to be so nice. And this idea of, like, being with God and everything being okay. Everything. Not, not part of it, not like we're just healed, but like we're perfect with Him. One day we will stand in His presence, and it's going to be amazing. Is that the passion of your life, or is there something else? Is that the thing that you consider and think about and wait for and expect and hope on? Or is there other stuff? We're all busy people. We've all got other things going on. Is that your main objective? Is one day, one day I will stand before him. I need to serve him now. We desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. See, I want you to be in this position where you know that 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 you have assurance of your faith that one day you will stand with Him. That's the point of all of this. There's so much out there to distract us, even in when, when times are normal, right? When times are just going normal, it's like there's so much to distract you. Good things. When times are like this, it's even worse. Don't get so caught up in this world that you forget that you're bound for another one. Jesus talked so much about this idea of storing up treasure here, right? Oh, not at all. There's all of these images and pictures and understanding that this stuff is going to burn up and melt and turn to ash. We've talked about that, that thought before of like having that Christmas gift or that birthday gift that you've been waiting for. And you're just like, yes, I can't wait. My birthday, maybe I can talk them into giving me like a day early. And then you finally get it. I remember mine was this remote control car uh, that jumped when you hit a button. And I got it. And what did I get? It was terrible. It was such a disappointment. You hit the button and it just like flipped over or flopped and it's you know, it just this lame thing. Maybe y'all aren't as susceptible to commercials as I am. <laughs> I see a commercial I'm like you're really close to that. Um, but that's the point. Like all of this stuff is eventually just going to fade away. Are you putting your treasure where it matters? Is your heart, is your earnestness, is your passion? in the thing that is eternal. I, I like the Olympics. Uh, me and Natalie were talking about kind of being bummed that the Olympics is getting pushed away a year. But I like to watch the Olympics because I like to see people who have put every ounce of everything that they have into something. You see these uh, gymnasts, and gymnasts especially, because I, I don't know if you've ever tried to do any of that, but like, it's not easy. I watch the guy on the rings, and he's standing like just holding like this, and I'm like, that looks easy. And then I can't do a pull-up. So I'm like, okay, maybe the, the algebra is wrong in my head. So seeing someone who's just like, man, 
man, everything is all about this thing. You, you see elite athletes, football players, baseball players. I don't know about baseball players. They just kind of stand around. They hit a ball and they run, and then it's like they go stand around more. Uh, eat sunflower seeds. Baseball is cool. But it, like you see these people who are just like in it, right? Have you ever stopped and really thought about that? Have you ever watched a, a college football game and you've seen these just elite athletes down there and these elite coaches and these fans and everybody's just going crazy over this thing? And have you ever just like, has it been in your, like, just to feel sorry for them? That they're putting all of their heart and effort and motivation and money and guts and everything into something that doesn't matter at all. At all. Isn't that a terrible thought? It's a terrible thing to think of. Are you putting everything into Christ? And that is a question that we really need to wrestle with. As we move on to verse 12, it says, So that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The whole reason I'm telling you this is not because I think you're unsaved. Like he, he's wanting to get that out of the way. He's like, it's not because I think that about you. He's like, I'm wanting you to be warned and know that there will be people that will come in like that. But that's not what I think of you. What I'm wanting you to understand is don't rest. Don't give up. Continue on. The fight is still going. Don't be sluggish. Stay in practice. I, I don't like to exercise uh, at all anymore. Uh, I, I never really did. I used to when I was younger because I wanted to have a wife one day, so I was like, I need to like, you know, look at least like I care. I, I never really did. I remember when me and my friend would ex like work out, uh, we were the only two that took uh, weightlifting at school. And <laughs> it was just all funny anyways. But uh, he was like kind of serious about it, and I was always making jokes, trying to get him to drop the bar on himself. Um, but, uh, it, I don't, I never really cared about that. Anyways, but then there's been times where I've tried over and over again to like get back into it or get back in shape. And uh, at this point, my knees sound like Velcro whenever I stand up, so I'm not too like worried about it anymore. Um, but have you ever gone from a time of being in shape and then taking some time off and then try to get back into it again? Is it easy? Is it fun? No. Oh. Have you ever, have you ever taken 20 years off from doing math, and then tried to teach a child how to do math? <laughs> Your brain is like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> You're sluggish in it, right? It takes constant practice to stay up on stuff. You have to continuously condition your mind and your body to continue to do these things. That's the point of what he's trying to say here. He's like, don't get sluggish. Don't sit around and look at what happened in the past. Think about what you can do right now. Keep yourself tuned up so that you can be ready to go and do. I, I know someone, and we, we talked for a while, and I remember one time he told me, he's like, I couldn't go on an international mission trip because I'm too fat. He just straight up told me that. Uh, and my, my first thought was, well, then maybe you should lose some weight. And that sounds mean, doesn't it? That, that seems like a mean, hateful thing to say, but I'm not trying to be mean. That's what he's saying here. He's saying if you're too out of shape to do the things that you need to be doing, then you need to change something. And that's not just talking about a physical thing. That's talking about our spiritual condition. If you're so out of shape spiritually that you don't even care about this stuff anymore, then you need to change something. That's the point of what he's trying to put last week and the week before. If you're getting sluggish, you need to take care of that. Don't just continue to slip and go and not worry about it and take another week. Yeah, next week I'll start doing that. Tune it up now. We don't have a whole lot of time left. I, I'm, I'm 37, 37. Uh, I, I forget all the time. I don't care that much about it. I'm 37, so I, I told the kid, or we were talking about this silly stuff yesterday, and I said, maybe I got like 40 years. Uh, 43 years, I'll be 80, I think. 
And uh, like in my family, that's kind of like that's pushing up on the limit there. But I thought like, okay, so I got 80 years, uh, 43. I think I've got that math right in my head. But uh, like, okay, so that's all I got left. Like that's legitimate. Okay, like, let's think through that. It's not a lot of time. That's quick. Four decades goes by very, very fast. We don't have forever to do what we need to do. You've been called, you've been commanded to go and make disciples. To go and comfort those that are in need. To care for widows and orphans. You have been called and commanded to go. Not to build, not to create something here. You've been called to go. Don't rest on what's happened in the past. Don't continuously sit back and think about how much better it used to be. Look at what you can do today and tomorrow. Keep your mind and your heart and your, your body even tuned up to be ready to go and do the things that we need to be doing. Right? That's the point. That's what he's trying to get apart. Like, don't be sluggish. And if you are sluggish, get it fixed. I've spent a lot of time now as a parent. Uh, I have a 10 year old, I have an 8 year old, I have a 5 year old, and I have a 2 year old. So you combine that, it's a lot of time. Uh, <laughs> I'll go with that that way. Uh, and there, there's many times where you tell your child to do something, what do they do? <laughs> you had a really funny look on your face. <laughs> uh, you must have experienced some of the things I've experienced too. Uh, but you, you tell your kid, like, your room's dirty, and what do they do? Oh. <laughs> like, what am I saying when I tell you that your room's dirty? Go clean it. Go clean your room. <laughs> your room's a mess. Go fix it. Right? That's kind of the point of right here. It's like, here's this thing that I want you to understand. So often we read the Bible and like, man, those are good principles. <laughs> for someone else, <laughs> right? <laughs> We need to hold on to these things for ourselves. We need to let the Holy Spirit apply it to our hearts so that we understand that we are the point of the message that's being presented throughout Scripture. When we read Scripture and we see what He's telling us, that's the point. Apply it to you. Don't go try to dig the moat out of somebody else's eye with your beam in your eye. Fix you. Get yourself ready. Go do the things that you need to be doing. I've had enough time in ministry to spend too much time with people who want you to fix everything. Right? I remember so many times having people say, we should be doing this. And you know what I finally figured out to say? You should be doing that. Go make it happen. We should be going over here and doing this. Like, go ahead. What's stopping you? I had somebody, and I love this person to death, but they would constantly come and say, we need to be going and working at this, and we need to be going, we should take the real like, okay, organize it, let's go. I'll go with you wherever you want to go. But don't just sit around and think about what everybody else should be doing and how the Bible applies to their, their lives. And this stuff is for us. This is for me. We have a Mission. Now you got a lot of y'all in the military. Y'all understand that. The mission matters, right? I read a lot about uh, World War II and World War I. And, uh, the first time I encountered this idea of cowardice, like of turning around in the face of like charge, what do they do to you? What do they do to you if you deserve it? Oh, dude, that's crazy. <laughs> that's wild. Because the mission matters. Obeying the commands that you've been given matter. We have something to do. Let's go do it. Don't just read it and think about it and move on. Internalize it and go forward. Take it for what it is. Don't get sluggish. But be imitators of those who, through faith and patience, inherit the promises. Read a book about somebody who's going to do it. Find somebody that you can be around that's going and doing it. I, I love to read books about missionaries because missionaries, I think, are like the James Bond of, of Christianity, right? They just 
And then you read the book about it and you realize they don't see that at all. I can never. But read some stuff about what they're doing and see it because it encourages you. It helps you to know that it's possible to go and do incredible things all over this world. Find people who can inspire you to go forward in your relationship with Christ and to do the things that we're called to do. We all know, we all know the principle that if you're around people who are negative, what's going to happen to you? It rubs off really quick. I remember always telling teenagers, like, if you're around this friend group that's constantly cursing and doing drugs and having sex and doing all the things that you say you don't want to do, what do you think is going to happen? You're going to lift them from the depths and, you know, jump right in there with them. We need to find the people that are going to encourage us. We need to be the people that are going to encourage someone else. Go forward and do what it is that we're called to do. I'm not saying don't pay attention to the world that's around us, but pay less attention to it. I'm not saying to forget about coronavirus or COVID-19 or whatever it is that's, that's out there or the riots or the country or the, anything. I'm not saying forget about that. I'm saying don't let those be the things that are so big in your heart and your mind that you forget that we have a mission, that we're not here like we're pilgrims that are passing through this place that we have a home that we'll one day go to. This isn't it for us. The reason that I believe so many people are so terrified about this coronavirus thing is because this is it for them. They've got one life, and when it's over, it's over. They've got to eat, drink, and be merry and get as much out of it as they can. Our life awaits. Standing in the presence of our Father is waiting for us. We have a mission to do while we're here. That's the thing that should drive us. Not anything else. Let's pray.